Yeah, community matters. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And let me say it again. Community matters. Hawaii has a fabulous community which is so diverse. We all respect each other's uh, you know, backgrounds. We all respect each other's races and religions. In, in a sense, uh, it was, is, and I hope it will be a kind of heaven on earth in terms of the diversity of our people. And one of the sects, if you will, one of the religious groups is the Jewish people. Rabbi Itchel Krasnjansky, with a Y. <laughs> he, he's the leader, the chief rabbi, if you will, of the Hawaii chapter of Chabad, Chabad of Hawaii. He joins us every now and then, and we can kind of put things together about what's going on um, in the Jewish community. Hi, Rabbi. Hi, Jay. It's a pleasure to be here, as always. So we, um, we're going to talk today about Kislev. Uh, did I pronounce that right? Kislev? Yes. It's a month. Yes. Oh, and it's 12 months in the uh, Hebrew calendar. It's, They're kind of different than the right, Western cal calendar. Right. But, it's, uh, it's the third Jewish month on the Jewish year. We just celebrated two months ago the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, which was the month of Tishrei. Then there was a quiet month with no holidays, which was Teshvan. And this month is Kislev. Once again, we have some very important holidays that we celebrate in this month. So Kislev, when is it? Is it synonymous with December? Well, it usually falls out around December. We are today on the, in the fifth day of Kislev. Uh, today we are the 3rd, December 3rd, correct? Yeah. Uh, so it's pretty close. The difference between the Jewish calendar in general and the, and the secular calendar, the Gregorian calendar, is that the Jewish calendar is a lunar-based calendar. Because by the months are based on the moon, cycle of the moon. Uh, the, you know, the reemergence and the rebirth of the moon marks the beginning of the new month in the Jewish calendar. The Gregorian calendar is a, is, a, is a solar calendar. Pope Gregory, right? yes. back in the, I don't know, third, fourth century or something like that. Something like that. And there's a difference in the amount of days between the lunar calendar and the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar has several more days than the lunar calendar. So in the Jewish calendar, every couple of years, we have a leap year, meaning we have two months of Adar. To, to, you know, to straighten out because the Jewish holidays are season, seasonal holidays. The Torah ties the Jewish holidays like Passover is spring. In order for Passover to always be in the spring, every three, four years in the Jewish calendar, we have a, another 30 days that we insert. So Passover you know, gets pushed off 30 days and uh, it's always in the spring. How charming, actually, in a, in a world of Gregorian... <laughs> We have the Jewish calendar and a lunar reference. So is it, are they both the same 365 days a year? No, the, uh, the lunar calendar's year is 354. Really? <laughs> How interesting. Yeah, Do you have to synchronize once in a while? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why we have the leap year. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's why we have the leap year. <laughs> and by the way, uh, it's interesting, but the calendar and the, and the establishment of the Jewish calendar was one of the first commandments given to the Jewish people right, right after they left Egypt. And the commentaries explain because the idea of time, the value of time, and the sanctity of time is really at the, is, is at the bedrock of everything that, you know, that we do. And we is know that a Jewish concept? Or yes, is that, that's, yeah. a, that's a Jewish idea. And, and what's interesting is that we know that the task of the Jew, as Judaism teaches us, is to sanctify and elevate everything of this in this world, to turn physical things into spiritual things, by infusing them with meaning and purpose. The first thing that was created, you look back at Genesis, you uh, actually will probably get it wrong, because the first thing that was created, you would think, as it says in the, in the Jewish Bible, the heaven and earth were created first, the space. The truth is, time was created first. Because before creation, there was no concept of time. There was no concept of before, and now, and after. That's a creation. So time is really the first thing that was created. So the first commandment in the Torah to the Jewish people was to sanctify time. That's why Shabbat is such an such a, a anchor in the Jewish life, to this idea of sanctifying time. 
where you can set your watch, so to speak, on these special days of the week like Shabbat um, and the special holidays in the month and year. Um, those are timekeeping devices. Yeah? Exactly. The other, the other thing about time is, uh, and I'm, I was telling you before the show, is that I'm connecting the dots of my own worldview these days. Uh, and one of the things that, one of the dots I connect is, is about time. And it's about, uh, you know, we all have a limited amount of time to do whatever we're going to do. And we have to see it that way. We have to see it that way in terms of, uh, you know, what we achieve, what we learn, uh, where we go, what we participate, what kind of projects, what kind of organizations we associate with, and also the relationships we have. It's all limited. And so you have to see it as limited, and then you have to spend it wisely. Yeah, that's very correct. That's a very beautiful insight. And it's interesting because in the Torah portion that we read last week, we read about Jacob and Esau, the two children that were born from Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, Isaac was the second of our, of our uh, three founding fathers of the Jewish nation, the forefathers. Jacob um, is the third one. Jacob is a righteous person, and Esau is he's the, he's the firstborn, but he is uh, a man of the field, as the Bible describes him, and he was a hunter and a deceiver, etc., etc. And... Um, there's a story in the Torah portion that we read is that uh, one day he comes from the field and he's very, very hungry. And he turns to his brother Jacob and he says, can you give me from this lentil soup that you're making? And Jacob says to him, sell me your birthright and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the soup. It's too long to get into why Jacob said that. But Esau, Esau said to himself, I'm going to die anyway, so what value is the birthright? He says, yeah, sure, take the birthright and just give me the, the, the lentil soup. So we see that for Esau, or his worldview was, because time is, is finite, I'm sorry, because life is finite, and we only live a certain amount of time, so of what value can anything be? Because, you know, at some point we're gone. Yeah. So, therefore, whatever is good for the moment, you know, it takes precedence. And yet we find in the Talmud, Talmud says that you know that King David, King David composed the book of Psalms. And one of the things that inspired King David to sing these songs of praise to God and, and faith in God is that he realized, he looked at the day of death, and that inspired him to sing these songs of the Psalms. Mm -hmm. You have two, two different like a, a split screen. Esau, Esau looks at death and says, life is not worth living, nothing can be sacred because it's all going to end. And David looks at death and realizes that life is finite and we have to utilize every moment and accomplish, as you're saying, you know, every, you know, every moment that we can to utilize it fully because we're not going to be around forever. Yeah, and both recognize the essential truth that it's finite. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go back okay. to the calendar. Okay. Islam. Um, it has Hanukkah. We talked a little about Hanukkah. Maybe you want to talk some more about it. Because now we, we talked before it was coming up. Right. Now it's already happened. And so no, Hanukkah is still coming up. It's, uh, like I said, today is the fifth day of the month of Kislev. And Hanukkah falls out on the 25th day of the month of Kislev. Oh, right around Christmas. So, right, exactly, yeah. Uh, so it's in about three weeks. A little less than three weeks. And uh, yeah, Hanukkah is one of the most joyous Jewish holidays. And um, the Festival of Lights. Festival of Lights, Latkes. <laughs> Latkes, the Maccabees, uh, the, uh, the, the, the oil that burned in the lamp. Exactly. Much longer than anyone expected. Exactly, the miracle yeah. of the light. So uh, we can talk about Hanukkah, but before Hanukkah, um, is the, uh, which is on the 25th day of the month of Kislev, is uh, the 19th day of the month of Kislev. In Hebrew, it's called Yud Tes Kislev. Okay, Yud, Yud is 10. Yeah, and Tes is 9. Tech is 9. Right. So 19. 10 comes before the 9. That gives you 19. Correct. Okay. Um, right, just like in the English calendar, 1 9. Yeah, yeah right. So 10 plus 9. Right, exactly. Right. So, um, 
by the way, because in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew alphabet, the letters are also the numerics. So Aleph is one, Yud is ten, and Tess is nine. So um, on Yud Tess Kislev, the nineteenth day of Kislev, a little over two hundred, two hundred and fifty years ago, the uh, Alter Rebbe, he's referred to uh, in Yiddish as the old Rabbi. He was the founder of the Hasidic movement, of the Chabad Hasidic movement. That's your movement. Right. His name was Rabbi Schneer Zalman. Uh, and that's why the family dynasty was called Schneer's son, because his name was Schneer. So the second and third generation were so called... Schneer was the original name. Right, Schneer, right. And then this all happened in Russia. What part of Russia? Yeah, this happened in Russia. The Alter Rebbe was born in a town called Liadi. I think it's in Belarusia. Um, he lived in another town called Lyozna. And um, he began to disseminate the teachings of his master, his name was uh, Dov Ber of, of uh, Mizrich. That was, that was a town where his master was from. And his master was a disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, who was the founder of the Hasidic movement. And basically, the Hasidic movement was steeped in Jewish mysticism, in the esoteric teachings of the Torah. Can you, can you help me with the, the mysticism part? Okay. Mysticism sounds mystical, exactly. um, but what, what is that? You know, uh, should, should we be concerned about it? Should, is it? Is it the kind of thing you don't want to touch? Is it the kind of thing that's uh, hard to understand? What is it? Okay, that's a very good question. And when it began to emerge into the, you know, into the wider community, there were many people who, who actually expressed the very same sentiments you were just expressing, that it's, uh, you know, we should stay away, it's dangerous. It's, it's uh, the teaching, the mystical teachings of the Torah, the esoteric teachings of the Torah are the soul of the Torah. Just like a human being has a body and a soul, this, the, the body is through which we function, right? We eat, we pick up, we walk, talk, these are functions of the body but there is a soul that animates the body, that gives it life, that, 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 that differentiates, that soul is what differentiates a living person from a dead corpse. That corpse also has all of the functions, all of the whole body before it decays, but it's, it's not a living being. In the same way also, the Torah has a lot of laws, and what we call mitzvahs, commandments. And that is the body of the Torah. These are the function, the function, the functionary aspect of the Torah. Keep the Shabbos, keep kosher, do this, don't do that. But the soul of the commandment, what is the life behind the commandment? And what is the inner meaning, the deeper meaning of the commandment? The things are more than they seem. Exactly. You have so, to look to the next so that's, level. So that's the uh, esoteric teaching of the Torah. So the Torah is like, it's almost like a code. You have to, in the esoteric teachings of the Torah, you know, it helps us decipher the code. So okay. that what the Torah is, is not just telling us do's and don'ts, but it's, it's opening us up to a whole deeper dimension of reality. You know, there's a, um, a building in, in Shamanad called the Mystical Rose. Uh, uh, I forget the, the full title of the building, but the word is there. And I'm thinking that you know, mysticism is not limited to Judaism. There are other religions, too, that have mystical concepts that are core to understanding that particular religion. In this right. case, Catholicism. Correct. So in Judaism, for example, uh, the mystical teachings of Judaism, we learn about the, um, the essence of the person. I'll give you an example. So, according to the, psycho the psycho psychologist, psychiatrist, the last generation, like what Freud taught, is that man is driven by some basic instinct. It's the, it's the pursuit of power, pleasure, fame, whatever they may be, and whatever the different school of, of, of psychology is. And um, according to the, this school of psychology, 
man is basic man is basically like an animal we have animalistic drives what separates us from the animal is that we can conceal we have a, we have a mind so we can we can keep things in check and conceal what's lying at the core or the subconscious and presumably contain as well and contain as well yeah Judaism in the mystical teachings of the Torah it teaches us the very very opposite that man is inherently godly that if you dig down deep what you'll come at is a, a, a core of goodness and godliness a spark of God that is the essence of who we are and um, often that is concealed we have to just like when you dig for a well you got to dig deep not give up in the same way also you have to probe and probe until we're able to tap into the essence of who we are so that, that's that's hard to do if um if, if you believe that then you find that there's uh, some, some awful things that have happened in the world to sure. wit the holocaust I even the terrible if you haven't seen the sure. devil my name the, the devil my neighbor is a movie now about Ivan the Terrible very interesting movie um, but it, you know when you find out that there's a, somebody who doesn't really seem to have any goodness at all in him zero or only evil um, then how do you reconcile that with the notion that everyone at the core is good so um, firstly um, uh, there are individuals like you describe who are uh, thoroughly evil so it's I, I guess just by way of an example and this is what actually one of the teachings of the Alter Rebbe the one who we celebrate his uh, release from prison on the 19th day of Kislev so he writes that because we know we all have free choice that's a very that's a given in in Judaism we all have free choice we can choose to do good we can choose to do bad we have these forces within us the godly soul within us seeks to inspire us to be more godly and more selfless and be kind and caring and good. But then we also possess an animal soul within us. This is what the mystical uh, teachings tell us, which drives us to the pursuit of hedonism, pleasure, and basically everything ego-related. And it's a constant struggle. It's a constant the old battle. dichotomy, isn't it? It's, it's a, a constant battle. Mind. So, what, what, what Judaism teaches us, number one is that man has the ability, every person has the ability to have their good side, their godly soul, come out on top and control and contain the, the impulses, the evil impulses we have within us. To the point where we can actually vanquish them, we can transform them into, into forces of good. The good within us can never be uh, eradicated totally, because that's the essence of who we are. But it could be so deeply buried uh, where a person may not even know it's there. So if a person chooses to do bad and to be bad, the person is moving away from their true essence that's true with the core of their being to the point where they can become totally disconnected from will, who they will are. it catch up with him this person well um, or is it possible that it will never catch up well you see that's a very good good question so if we look at the world and at life you know from you know you know from very um uh, uh external point of view peripheral point of view, then yes, it's possible that a person can pass through life and never repent and never and, and never change and, and, and die an evil person. We, we need to receive it a lot. But the truth is we all know that uh, we don't see the bigger truth, meaning there's the idea of the reincarnation of souls, past lives and future lives, and the life that we live now, the snapshot of the present, is just one, you know, it's, it's one moment or one part. Back to time. Back to time. <laughs> so uh, in, in, that re in, in the larger pic context, you know, only God knows, you know, the, the journey of, of the souls. Yeah. Very important stuff. So um, I'm not sure we're going to get to a lot more holidays. In, in the <laughs> so let me, let me just share with you one interesting thing. Yeah. 
When the Alter Rebbe was arrested, and he was arrested on trumped up charges that his teachings were somehow uh, stirring some kind of uh, rebellion within under the Tsarist rule, and and because also Israel at that time was controlled by Turkey, and Turkey and Russia were in a war. This is the 17th century. Yeah, right. And um, the Alter Rebbe was sending money to Jews living in Israel who needed help financially, poor people. And, he, and it was misconstrued that he was sending money to the enemy. So <clears throat> when he was in prison, um, they had some the education minister come in to interrogate the Alter Rebbe to try to figure out who this man is and what his teachings are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he spoke to him, and he, in a short while, he realized that this was a saintly person, and all of the lies that were said about him were not correct. So. Um, at the end of his interrogation or interview of the Alter Rebbe, he said, I have a question to ask. This is clearly you're a scholar. I'd like to ask you a question that's been bothering me for a long time. And he said, sure, what's the question? So he says, you know, I, I studied the Bible, and there's um, a passage in the Bible that has troubled me for a long time, and that is in the very beginning in Genesis, when Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, and uh, they sin by eating from the tree of knowledge when God told them not to eat from the tree of knowledge. So it says that, that after they ate from the tree of knowledge, after Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge, God comes into the Garden of Eden and he asks man, Adam, in the Torah, Adam, first human being, asks him, Ayeko, where are you? So the question that this man had for the Alter Rebbe is, what is God asking Adam, where are you? God knows everything. Presumably he knows where. He knows exactly uh, where he is. So the Alter Rebbe told him what the commentaries say, and the basic commentaries, that obviously God knew where he was, but God wanted to enter into a conversation with him and ask him, did you eat from the tree of knowledge that I told you not to eat from? So he started the conversation by asking, where are you? Sounds like therapy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what the Alter Rebbe told this, this minister. The minister said, I know what this commentary is, but I always felt there's something more deeper here. So the Alter Rebbe asked him, do you believe in the eternity of the Torah, that God's word is eternal? He said, yeah, I believe that. He said, the meaning is as follows. This is God's call to Adam, but Adam is really all of man, mm -hmm. all, of ma all of humanity. That God calls each and every one of us with the question, where are you? And the Alter Rebbe says an example. If a person is 60, 70 years old, and the Alter Rebbe actually stated the exact age of this person. And so the question God's calling to that person is, where are you? What are you doing in this world? Have you accomplished the purpose? Within which, your allotted time. Within your allotted time. <laughs> Before we uh, run out of time, speak, speaking of which, I would like to go back to something you and I talked about before the show began. Okay. <clears throat> and that's a discussion, uh, it's a continuation for me of a discussion a, a day or two ago, yesterday I think, about the nature of the family in our society. And it strikes me that, that Judaism, um, and that the people around you in Chabad have a special value on family. And I, I would like you to tell me about that. Sure. Uh, in Judaism, uh, the family is the most important uh, unit, the most important uh, part of our lives. And so much of the commandments, the mitzvahs, are to strengthen the family uh, unit. Uh, firstly, the Torah believes in the mitzvah, meaning the, the uh, good, deed. good deed, the obligation of marriage. Marriage is one of the 613 commandments of the Torah, to get married. So the Torah is telling you, get us, to get married. Right. Because yes. it's a mitzvah. It's a good thing. Exactly. And, uh, and, and, and the famous it, words it, of the Torah is, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife and become one flesh. That's the first thing. The other mitzvah related to that is, there's a mitzvah to have children. And according to the Torah, as explained in the oral tradition of Talmud, we have a commandment to have one, a one boy and one girl, a male and a female. That's the biblical Keep the commandment. Fi the, the, uh, 
be fruitful, fertility rate up. Be, be fruitful and multiply. Yes. That's the first commandment <laughs> given to man. Uh, but obviously, if God forbid someone can't have children medically or whatever, that's a different story. But if someone can, then the Torah uh, obligates us to have at least two children, a boy and a girl, but also encourages us to have many children. Every child is explained in the Torah as a blessing, as a channel of blessings. So the family unit is, is, is very important. The whole idea of Shabbat, Sabbath, and why the Sabbath is such a holy day is because it's family-centered. Right? And in Judaism in general, as we spoke before, it's not, the center of Judaism is not in the synagogue. The center of Judaism is in the home. And it's there where we are uh, meant to, to express all of the values and the teachings of the Torah is in, in, in the home. So it's more than just following, you know, the, the time schedule, like Shabbat and all that. It's more than just following the rituals uh, at various holidays and times. Um, it's something else, too. It's, it's, um, it's a matter of um, having the children, but also teaching the children and bringing them, making them a family. So what, what, what kind of detail do we get about that? Here I am in the home. I've performed all the rituals. I've maintained the time schedule that is called for for the, the week of the month. Mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I make a good home family, family home under the, under the Torah? So, for example, take Shabbat, for example, right? Take the Shabbat. I'm sure you remember your uh, childhood experience of Friday night. It was the Kiddush, it was the Shabbat uh, dinner, and that was a time when the family whether it was just the immediate family or guests or the extended family, would get together and would have a Shabbat dinner. That's something which is, which is critically important to foster family relations and the, you know, the ties that tie parents and children and siblings to one another. You know, that's what Shabbat is all about. That's what the holidays were all about. Yes, we went to synagogue and we prayed, but then we went home and we had this meal and discussed everything and questioned and spoke words of Torah or just politics, whatever. So it, the emphasis on, uh, on the family and the home is, is very, very strong in Judaism. So much so, the, we live in a society, at least in the United States, where it's the rugged individual, you know, that is, you know, you are who you are. In Judaism, you are part of a family. You know, it used to be a tribe. But now, you know, then family. And, and, and that's how you identify yourself. You know, I am, I'm a member of this family. So one, one last question yeah. before we have to break. Um, and that's this. So when you send, you do your duty, you get married, you have children, two at least, and maybe more. Um, and you, you have this warm, loving family in the home, the Jewish home. And then they leave. They go. Because they have to go. They're, they have to leave the nest. Yes, the, the family so expands. The family, uh, maybe, you know, in my, for example, my family. My parents live in New York. My older brother lives in Australia. We live in Hawaii. I have a brother that, uh, another brother lives in New York. Another brother lives in Montreal. So we, we're scattered around the world, as well as our children or whatever. So, you know, especially today, with the technology today, uh, geographic uh, distances are really not uh, barriers. So what I get out of this, Rabbi, it's a more of a psychological. Uh, is that the, you know one of the big? There are probably many things we could talk about, but one of the big gifts you want to give to those children who leave the nest is stay in touch. Stay in touch with the family. We're still a family. It doesn't matter where you are. We're we're a global family. And, and, the, and the love that you, the, you know, the attention, the um, sense of family that you had while you grew up in our household must continue, should right. continue. We right. want to leave that message with you. So right. it does continue. Right. And by the way, in a, in a larger sense, but equally true, is that this is what is the blessing of the Jewish people. That we're all one big family. And uh, wherever, one, wherever a Jew is, you go travel to Venice and you'll just walk into a synagogue you'll feel like you're at home. It doesn't matter that they may speak a different language, yeah. but it's, you know, and... Uh, well, so that's why we should do another show. We should, <laughs> should go where you have to go. I'll go where I have to go, and then we'll come back again. 
Pleasure. A big family at this table. With pleasure. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Jay. Wonderful to see you as always. Yeah, thank you. Uh,